Hey everybody, Scalcraft here again. TGIF, it's Friday. It's going great. Everything's going good. The weather's going good. Got a few things to do today. Uh, a couple things to talk about. Uh, make it into a little bit of mosh. I got some uh, footage I want to get off the camera. So let's get started right okay, away. Okay, first off, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to beat a dead horse, okay? But these things have got me to the point where I clean them up a little. Uh, remember now, I want to tell you again, uh, people have been saying that, you know, that f is probably a fish, uh, deboner or something, but I just don't understand how this would work. First of all, let me show you something. It's sharp here. It's sharp here. The whole edges are sharp. And one of our, our subscribers had mentioned, he says, you know, maybe this could be for punching into a, a sack, you know, opening and taking a sample out, which makes more sense than a fish boning. Because first of all, why would you have this hollow in here for fish boning? Secondly, why wouldn't this have any kind of uh, teeth? You know, most fish boners I see have some kind of teeth to grab the bone. Because, you know, fish bones are slippery. This is a smooth steel fish. So it, it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, this whole thing like this. And also, what kind of fish are going to be deboning with this? It's so big. You know what I mean? Or you're going to be doing shark. And, and you know, for fish boning, mostly, don't you, you know, it's a kind of a delicate operation. You know, you peel the big bones off and then with a the small pliers. It makes no sense to me. So, I don't know. I don't, I just, this thing has got me perplexed. So, I'm, I'm going to try and contact F. Dick Company today. Send a picture of this and ask them if they could tell me what it is because the ones i see on their catalog are all small they look and they're all stainless steel this is this is high carbon steel which means it would rust in a second again it don't make sense and you know and painted they don't usually paint surfaces of tools they're going to be using in the fish industry and stuff but the handles were painted just no, nothing makes sense on this and it's bugging okay me. first up for friday's mosh we're going to take care of this little abis lock look at the condition that this is in you know what's nice about these locks? They do clean up so nice, you know? And uh, Abus makes good locks. Uh, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's a laminated lock. So let's clean it up, take a look at it, and talk a little bit about it. Okay, we're calling this project done. You know what's so nice about Abus padlocks is that in 1924... August Brimmicker started the uh, the company in Germany and uh, him and his sons. And you know what? Uh, it's still in the family. Uh, the CEO today is a gentleman by the name of Christian Brimmicker. And uh, so it's still in the family. And I always like that. Uh, you can see what we did here with the pad. You know, it looks factory new almost. You know, we cleaned it up, polished it, uh, did the bottom up. And then you know, like everything else, once you get all the dirt, we vacuum all the dirt out, and then we uh, wipe the whole lock down with WD-40 just to get any uh, polish, uh, resi uh, residual polish off and everything. And then to lubricate it, like I said, once we vacuum it, uh, we, I like this Tri-Flow. I love this. This is such great stuff. Tri-Flow. I love the smell, too, you know? Anyway, uh, when, when it operates correctly, the, it should just, the key should just slip in so easily. And then just like that, just pop open. It's it's such a beautiful uh, mechanism, you know, when you think about it. And another important thing when you're going to do any kind of padlock or restoration or anything like that, address the keys. Make sure the keys are clean. There's always dirt that gets in here and stuff, and that transfers into the lock. It also makes it difficult to operate. So when you have a clean, polished key, this will operate like this for years, and, and I just love these locks. Abus. And this model here is a uh, number 41, and it's 40 millimeters. You can see here on the bottom, 40 millimeters, and uh, made in Germany. Great little lock. Okay, real quick, I just have to get this out there. Um, you know, we talked about that short hammer challenge, the short handle hammer challenge. I have to tell you something. A um, couple people uh, I might be under the wrong impression that I'm telling you to take a, a normal size hammer if you only have one and cut it, cut it down. I'm not saying to do that. This is for the only for the people that are, are inflicted with hammer uh, hammeritis. That if you have more than six hammers in your collection, you know, then you might want to try something like this because uh, it really you will love it. But it's not meant for, you know, you don't want to take your only one hammer and cut it down and then limit yourself and the other jobs it can do. 
And uh, let's go over to the bench, and I'm going to talk about the ball peen and why uh, it makes a good candidate for a okay, cut typically down. your ball peen hammer is meant for delicate work and for a metal working, things like that, for, for uh, you know, peening over some rivets, things like that, you know, jobs that aren't made for... Uh, obviously a sledgehammer or something that would be heavier duty but and the reason you know that is because if you look at the hammer itself here's the head of a ball peen hammer and this is a pretty heavy one about 30 ounces uh, they make them 32 ounces this is a, a, almost as big as you get look at how small that handle hole is so that means think about this for a minute if you were meant to be sledging this thing away they would give you a bigger handle here is a carpentry handle and look how big that is compared, look at the hole size. The handle is almost a third bigger. That's because, and you're only driving nails, you're not even hitting stuff that's real hard. So, uh, you know, these aren't made for wailing away on things. They are made for certain. Now, first of all, the heads are tempered different so they don't ship because they're meant to drive punches, cold chisels, things like that. That is what a ball peen is for. So. The reason that I'm telling, you know, I'm challenging everybody to cut one of your hammers down, if you only have one, don't touch it, is because of, of the inherent use of what these are for. Now, we all know why there are hundreds and hundreds of hammers, ball peen hammers with split handles, because you have gorillas out there trying to use the wrong hammer for a different job, and they're slamming this thing away with the long handle, and that creates a weak point, which is why it splits. This is a problem we have with the ball peen, and that's why you have to, you know, only certain people should use a ball peen. If you see somebody wailing away with one of these hammers, you know they don't know now, what they're doing. Now, many times, ball peen hammers years ago used to be used for inspections and things like that, especially around the railroad industry or the boiler industry. And that's where you would take your hammer and you would knock on pipes and things like that to see the soundness and if it's going to rattle, if it's going to, you know, you could tell by the sound of something. And that's what they, that you had a long handle so you could get in and reach different areas. But by no means this long handle is meant that you be wailing away on something because if you do, you're going to break the thin Remember, the thin handle, and also, you're, you should be using a heavier hammer. Let's demonstrate a, a couple uh, uses for the short-handled hammer. One thing I wanted to point out is, first of all, the short-handled hammer shouldn't be a real light hammer, you know, like an 8-ounce ball peen or something is too light. You really should have at least a 16-ounce head to get the most use out of that hammer. And uh, first thing we're going to do is we got to rough up the hammer that I made uh, the face because you never want to have a polished now, face. Now, I did this for fun, but you never want a polished face on a hammer. So let's just rough it up real quick. Okay, you see we roughed it up a little bit. This way it won't slide off the punch or whatever you're using it. So that's imperative. Okay, the real beauty of uh, where these short-handled uh, heavy head hammers come in is when you're using... And the ball peen hammer was made to use uh, pu for punches and things like that and lettering and a lot of times. So if you use a standard ball peen, and this one's not a super light one, but you, you know, obviously if you were going to punch or something, you would choke up a little bit on the handle to get better control. And then you would drive it straight down like this to try and get a good punch. But because of the lightness of the head, you know, either you're going to have to take a heavier swing or you're going to have to try and use some force. It just uh, doesn't work out so well. Whereas if you took this hammer a heavier head shorter handle and you want to do that same punch you would bring it over here and just drop it down just like not too fast for you to see pointed out so eloquently is that you just drop the hammer down onto the punch especially if you're doing lettering or something so now you just punch that down and you know you get a lot of force with a little bit of uh, a drop and it's just, it's wonderful. And once you try it, you'll never go back. Another thing is, if you're going to use the ball, the, uh, for peening something over, you know, a lot of times what we'll do, you obviously, you're not going to use the end of the handle like this because you're not going to get, it's very hard to get that exact control. Remember, you have a small amount of hammerhead that you're trying to, uh, you know, to, to get accurately. So by using this, you can really get close up here. If, you know, if you choke up on this, you don't have the handle banging into your arm and you could really, I mean, you know, you, you could see just by using it. It's, it's, it's awesome. You got to get one of these. Okay. Next up, I want to uh, address this electrolyte number 18 tire spoon. And, uh, you know, what we're going to do with this here. Remember what the tip looks like, because this tip wouldn't really 
I know it's it's the way it's shaped. It really, anybody that's done any tie work knows that this needs to be kind of a little bit addressed to make it a little bit more user friendly. So we'll do that. Um, remember what I was telling you, any, especially when you get tools from the 20s or the teens or something, you got to be leery. A lot of times they were using galvanized and, and you know, uh, nickel plating is not bad, but you don't see too much of that. You know, only on the uh, finer tools, but something like this, they, they usually use cheap coatings. And that's the stuff you got to be careful of when breathing. So, you know, be careful with this stuff. You know, anytime you see like a coating like this, you say, oh, you don't know what it is. Mask up. Make sure you have your ventilation on. And let's see what we can do with it. First off, I wanted to address one thing. Look at the tip here from somebody banging it. So we're going to have to fix that out. So, but other than that. I don't see too many dings along the whole body. It's just, you know, pretty messed up. We'll get the big wire brush out for this. Now, as you know, there's a lot of different options you could use to take the corrosion off this tire spoon, but I do prefer the, uh, the angle grinder for the simple reason that it's so much fun to use. And that uh, 40 grit flap disc, this is a worn one, but you see how quickly it gets through the pitting and right down to fresh steel. So uh, I really enjoy this, and I know if you don't have one of these tools, you need to get one in the shop. It really will make your life so much easier in, uh, in getting through to this uh, fresh steel. Now, as far as reprofiling the spoon, I used the drum of the uh, belt, the stationary belt sander, which really worked good. And remember that little depression between the drum and the flat disc. That's your best friend for getting the top of the spoon. Okay, next up, got a quick little story for you. I was out walking the other night, and, uh, you know, I always uh, look at the garbage because you never know what's thrown out. So as I was walking, right down the block from me, somebody threw out a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica. And, uh, you know, it almost made me melancholy. It was almost sad to see it. It was like, oh, what a shame, you know, a, a full set. First of all, uh, the encyclopedias, anybody from my generation growing up before the internet, you know, uh, you were lucky if you had one in the house or somebody had one that was, you know, it helped you out with a lot of schoolwork, things like that. You didn't have to go to the library. And uh, all of a sudden, overnight, 2000, you know, the internet starts getting popular. By 2010, they were done. They said no more in print copies. They do an online version, but you know what that means, right? So I was like, what a shame, you know, obsolescence, how many things go obsolete and, and so quickly. And uh, I remember my grandmother had a book of knowledge. It was very similar, but it was from the 40s. And, and you know, because uh, anything that's five, 10 years old and, you know, some of that stuff is outdated, the information. But we used to love looking through there. And I, I thought when I saw that encyclopedia set in the garbage, I said, I bet you there are some books in there that never been opened. Think about all that knowledge being thrown away. And there are some countries that, you know, don't have internet or internet access. And, you know, they would starve for, the, uh, you know, uh, a find like that. And it just was made me sad to see that in the garbage. Uh, another thing was uh, some things that went obsolete overnight was... Uh, uh, digital cameras, you know, once these phones came out with these fantastic cam camcorders, remember we all had camcorders and digital cameras, all film cameras, you know, that was gone. But how fast things get, obs you know, obsolete now, it uh, makes you wonder. Now you know my favorite part. Remember what this Electrolyte tire spoon looked like before we started. And we are calling this project done. Boy, I really uh, put some time into this because... I just like the way this uh, this little tool would work. And let me show you now uh, what we have here. Of course, this is the, the Electrolyte number 18. You can see here, made in the USA. We did it with uh, Regal Red. And we were able to keep, you see that dimpling in there? We were able to keep that because we thinned out the paint. But let me show you the edges here. Remember the edge was all banged up and mangled up here. Look at that, huh? And again, I didn't go with a, a mirror finish, but it's a satin finish and it won't show the fingerprints. So, uh, but look how nice and smooth now, you know, you can get under a tire with that. And it's funny when I was doing this tool, 
I was thinking of my buddy Joe from Joe's shop, and I was like, I said, you know who would appreciate this? Joe, because Joe has done, he's used tire spoons before, and uh, he knows what it takes to, uh, to, to for one to work well. Now, you remember what it looked like before, that this was kind of a, a strange shape on there, very thick, but you see what I did? I reprofiled it, and the reason they call it tire spoon is it, it should resemble a spoon. You know, I don't know, that last thing was just super thick and you really can't get into the bead under a tire. And, and you know, you want to get in there and lift the tire up. There's no sharp edges. It's thick enough that it won't pinch anything or if you had a tube or something in there. Yet it's thin enough and it's just, just a perfect design for anybody that has ever used a tire spoon before. I'm sure will agree with me. This is a much better, you know, but again, they stamp them out and I'm sure they sold them, you know, just quick. But Interesting steel polished it out here and it's a uh, you know, I just I like tire spoons You know, I have a couple and and uh, you know, the old Bridgeport ones were nice that had the uh, wooden handles on them and stuff But this one is an all-metal one. I just thought it was pretty interesting and uh, For the two or three dollars. I forget what I paid for it, but it was definitely something I'm happy to have in closing a little bit of a Friday mosh there Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you have a great weekend. Take care now. Bye-bye